Hello, and good evening. Welcome to the Winona LaDuke Lecture. My name is Steele Engelman, and on behalf of the University Programs Cultures and Concept Committee, I am so glad you're able to be here tonight. Before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that there will be a Q&A at the end of tonight's event. If you have anything you want to ask Winona LaDuke or, or are wanting to know more about something she said during the lecture, tweet your question to at UP Arkansas. That's capital U-P, lowercase, A-R-K-A, I don't know how, I, you guys know how to spell Arkansas. <laughs> okay, or maybe you don't. Who knows? Ask your neighbor. Anyway, it might get chosen for, it might get chosen as a question. Thank you again for attending tonight's lecture, and enjoy. It's going to be a great one. Hello. Just gonna come up here like I own the place. Okay, um, we are so honored to have Winona LaDuke here and we are so happy to see all of your faces. This is such an exciting time and we're just so, so honored and privileged to have such an amazing woman come talk to us. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Winona. Winona LaDuke is a rural development economist and author working on issues of sustainable development renewable energy, and food systems. Uh, LaDuke, LaDuke's work is primarily focused on areas of indigenous economic, <laughs> economics, sorry, um, as well as food and energy policy. As executive director of Honor the Earth, she works nationally and internationally on issues of climate change, renewable energy, and environmental justice alongside indigenous communities. She has been awarded the Thomas Meriden Award in 1996, Woman of the Year with in, uh, Indigo Girls in 1977, and Reebok Human Rights Awards, and was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame in 2007. LaDuc was a co-founder and board co-chair of the Indigenous Women's Network for 15 years and maintains a significant role in international advocacy for Indigenous peoples. If you all will join me in welcoming the distinguished Winona LaDuke. Um, here she is. <laughs> Let's see here. Hi, how are you? Very nice to see you. I'm happy to be here. I left, uh, I left Fargo this morning. It was very cold. It was very cold. It was, and everybody is snowed in. I said, I see you in a few days. <laughs> it was very warm. So, it means hello, my relatives. Bear Clan. Uh, and uh, that's where I'm from, from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. And I'm very grateful to be here in, in your territory down here, Cherokee and other indigenous peoples. I'm grateful to be here in your territory. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our neck of the woods and, and uh, you know, indigenous thinkings in this time. but. Um, this is some art from our territory. Um, this behind me, right? Okay. Um, this is a piece by an, an artist named Votan, and I like this piece because there's been a lot of work on the issues of a missing and murdered indigenous woman. It's like, a, you know, so much, you know, and even where I live, like at night, sometimes you're afraid to look on the old Facebook because there's somebody missing. You know, and it's just, it is, it affects all our families, and my family lost someone too, you know. But this is Indian woman is not missing. She's very big. <laughs> She's on the American Indian Community Health Organization wall in downtown Duluth, and she's about 20 feet wide and 40 feet tall. So I just like to say, like, we're here. And this is some other art from my territory. Um, I don't know if you've seen this kind of art, but I just like to present it because when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, if you wanted to study the art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department, but if you wanted to study indigenous art, you went to anthropology. 
And so I just want to say this is a different worldview, and it is possible that the solutions to the problems we face today will not be found in the worldview that created a lot of those problems. So work together, you know? I swear I live, Gawawi Egema, Ground Lake. And um, in this moment in time, you know, in the state of the world that we are all in, there's uh, places where there are still wild things. And it's said that indigenous people are about 4% of the world's population, but we represent about 75% of the world's biodiversity. That's what we protect. And that's a really important thing to understand because Americans and most other countries are very anthropocentric. And so we're all about how much humans can have. But the, the survivability of all of us is actually, in Dinaway Muganatuk, is also contingent upon our relative survival. And they need that biodiversity. They need all of, all of that, uh, the wild. And even the UN is discussing now this, uh, there's a discussion at one of the UN uh, organizations if you have to leave 50% of the world for the wild things. So just think about that, you know, as we keep expanding things, right? So this is, of course, uh, my reservation is that box up in northern Minnesota. But, uh, you know, because most of you I'm aware have had an American education, so this map would be something new to you. Uh, but this is what reservation territories look like, this country. And, uh, oh, this is, this is uh, some Mi'kmaqs a few years ago fighting fracking in New Brunswick. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, making America great again. And so my idea of when America was great is when there was 10,000 varieties of corn. And that corn included everything from popcorn to all those red corns or pink corns or uh, eagle corn, Pawnee eagle corn, you know, all of these varieties. And I, and, I, and I think it's really important to talk about that because those varieties were, you know, corn doesn't exist in nature. It's chiosinte, it's a grass in nature. So corn is something that humans and plants made together. And I know I'm at a land grant institution that I'm saying this, but you know, part of the point is, is, that, is that people like me is who did that. It wasn't a guy from Monsanto in a suit. The agrobiodiversity of the world was you know, made from women, many women and men who looked like me or looked like all colors. So I was going to talk a little bit about um, Actually, let me just see what is, excuse me here. We were messing with our PowerPoint. Well, we're just gonna have to go with this part here. So I, America was great when there was 50 million buffalo. And they lived in the same place that today there are 28 million cattle. And those buffalo didn't need a fossil fuel system to support them. They lived on 250 different species of grass, and they transformed landscapes. America was great when there was uh, passenger pigeons which blackened the sky, and you could drink the water from every creek or river. That's when America was really great. And I want to say that because we live in a society which we're, you know, I think it's called ecological amnesia, <laughs> where you forget that there was once wild rice here or that there was once a forest there. And so I live where those wild things still are, and I don't forget. And I think it's really important to not forget because it's really about life, and it's really about life forms. And, uh, you know, but the conflict between these two worldviews in, you know, in our teachings, there's a lot of teachings that we have about this, but we would call this a Windigo economy, an economy which consumes more than it needs and it doesn't leave the rest and wastes a tremendous amount. And in that, at this moment in time, there's a huge amount of conflict going on. You know, a lot of us have our eyes, you know, on the Ukraine. You know, and, and it's a really sad thing, I think, that most, a lot of us learn our geography through conflict. 
you know, we don't know everything that came from the Ukraine and all the, you know, seeds. Uh, but um, in, in North America, we have a lot of these same conflicts. So these are some of the conflicts in this era. In this last stages of this fossil fuels economy, there's a set of pipeline projects that they've been trying to put in. And those are new pipeline projects because they shifted the source of oil from Venezuela to Canada. And they did that at the beginning of the 21st century. And when they did that, they pushed for more oil out of the Canadian tar sands. And then under the cry of American energy self-sufficiency, they pushed people back into the Bakken. And we started doing these things which are kind of called extreme extraction. Extreme extraction is like when the oil isn't gushing like it did in Oklahoma. Extreme extraction is when you have to frack the bottom of, you know, go 600 feet down and bust up the bedrock to get some gas out. Extreme extraction is 20,000 feet under the ocean. It's all good until the deep water horizon. And extreme extraction is the tar sands dirtiest oil in the world. So we're at this place, and those new pipelines that they are putting in are going through Indian country. And so this is just a picture of the map of the proposed Dakota Access Pipeline before. Uh, initially, it was, as you can see, earmarked for Bismarck. You all see that? But it ended up on Standing Rock. And the fact is, is, that, is that that's kind of a continuing practice of a few hundred years. Just let the Indians deal with it. And then it don't look good. You know, I have no idea of the knowledge of the people in this room of the violence that has occurred in the past 10 years for oil pipelines. But I've spent a lot of time in the past eight years of my life fighting oil pipelines. This is Standing Rock. This is Standing Rock. This is one of my favorite Standing Rock photos. <laughs> you know, it's this question of who gets to control the future of water, who gets to decide what the future is of energy, and do a people have a right to live? Or, you know, is this the st this, have we come to a place in the world where the rights of multinational corporations supersede, supersede the rights of people? And that's kind of what this looks like. And that's actually the factual law. Here's the buffalo I was talking about. I don't know, somehow that, those photos got him. And this is the remaining biodiversity too. This is our wild rice in northern Minnesota. Have you guys ever seen wild rice before? A couple of you? That looks like a pasture, but that's a lake. That's a lake that's called uh, Upper Rice Lake, and I'm standing there with Don Goodwin looking at this lake, which is the only place in North America, the only place in the world wild rice grows is in North America, and the only places it grows is in the places where we live, where the wild things are. And so that place, not unlike where the buffalo lived, has been uh, the source of this, has been the, the focal point for this battle over who has the right to decide the future. Right? And I think that really in some ways, Sitting Bull and, and Custer, the two characters exemplified here, really uh, illustrate the conflict between two worldviews. So in our teachings as Anishinaabe, we're told that we have a choice between two paths. Our prophets came to our people a very long time ago and said, in the time of the seventh fire, which they say is this time now. Your people will have a choice between two paths. One path, they said, will be well-worn, but it will be scorched. And the other path will, not, will be not well-worn, and it will be green. And it will be your choice upon which path to embark. A long time ago, Minwinja, this is when our prophets told us at the time of the seventh fire, we would have to make a choice between those two paths. And I'm pretty sure that that's just not our situation. I think that's all of us. And this 
moment is really what these conflicts are about for indigenous people. And I think it's really the same challenges that we all face. So, you know, we live in a time when there are catastrophes of biblical proportions around us. I mean, I'm looking at a bunch of people in an auditorium in masks. You know, to the west, this is actually, this is a fire in Fort McMurray, Alberta, in the tar sands. But the entire west coast has been on fire. The polar ice caps are melting. There are giant, you know, hurricanes and disasters to the south, and it looks like a lot of political disasters in the east to me. Having said that, I think about what Erin Dottie Roy, the Indian writer, says when she talks about pandemic as portal. She says that in the history of the world, the pandemics have always forced societies to change. This one is no different. It's a portal. It's a doorway between one world and the next. It's a portal. And the question is, what do you take through the portal? Do you take your avarice, your hatred, your data banks, your dirty rivers, or do you go through clean? That's really the question she asks. And in the time that we live in now, you have catastrophes of biblical proportions and a pandemic. You have social movements which are surging in this country. What do I mean by that? Like in my life, I did not expect to see 40 Columbus statues fall in a year. You know, there's, there's a lot of changes underfoot. And some of those are because we have no choice. Because you can't, uh, the pandemic has taught us that a lot of things about our food systems, a lot of things about our materials economy, a lot of time things about our presumptions of health. So in this time, we have this opportunity to make these changes. And um, no time like the present. <laughs> because the more that you refuse to change, the more expensive it gets. Doesn't that sound like personal addiction counseling or something? <laughs> it's like, look, it's going up, right? And nobody has a... You know, so that this is, that's where you get your additional economic disasters. So what am I saying? I'm saying that all of these things are going on at the same time, so let's stand up and make a change. So I'm standing in front of you. Last year at this time, this is what I was doing. I spent the last year with thousands of people in Minnesota trying to stop a Canadian pipeline, just like Standing Rock. This is a tar sands pipeline, 915,000 barrels a day, dirtiest and the largest tar sands pipeline in the country. Put in in a time of climate chaos and crisis. The deepest drought in the history of Minnesota was last summer. And to get their pipeline in, they stole 5 billion gallons of water from us. They backed up to municipal water supplies and wells in small towns in the north and took water so they could drill our rivers. Piercing aquifers, three aquifers were pierced and burning 28 rivers. And then they arrested us. This is my arrest, or one of them. I was charged in three counties as a water protector. I'm not a criminal, I'm a water protector. This is the Shell River, it's my home. I'm one of the women in their 60s sitting in a lawn chair at the front. Those are my grandkids in the back. You know, a thousand people were arrested and the shameful thing about, not only was it shameful to arrest a thousand people who were standing in front of equipment or standing on the water trying to stop, but what was more shameful was that the state of Minnesota required that the Enbridge Corporation pay for the police. And so Enbridge spent $5 million financing the police of Minnesota to arrest a bunch of people like me. And uh, the, the problem in my head of having a Canadian multinational finance your police is really kind of a constitutional and democratic problem to me. 
seems kind of like third world, right? Foreign country finances your police so that they can get a mining project in or a pipeline project. That's what just happened in Minnesota. And just that when I was getting out of jail. They all came to see me. And then this is where the pipeline continues. This is line five that is being fought now in Wisconsin, Bad River Reservation to the east of us. It has this line, it's been in there for 50 years. Pipes get old. You can imagine this problem. Right there by Superior, they want the pipe out. Enbridge says, we're not gonna move it. They said, no, you gotta move it, you're trespassing. They didn't return their, they did not renew their, their leases. They've been trespassing for seven years. The corporation won't move their pipe. They're now, uh, they're trying to, do you see that funny thing around that? They're trying to put it around the reservation now. Big set of litigation all the way over to Wisconsin, all the way over to Michigan, where it crosses the Straits of Mackinac. Affecting all through that is Indian community after Indian community after Indian community plus the Great Lakes, affected by this Canadian multinational. So this is kind of the end of the scorched path. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You end up in this choice between water and oil, and you end up with a lot of people getting arrested trying to protect their water. And you got the dirtiest oil in the world, and you got an opportunity to do better. And to me, that's kind of the portal, is the, uh, is the portal between two worlds. And that's what I call here the sitting bull plan. You can all take a breath. Are you guys all depressed now? <laughs> you know, I spent eight years fighting these guys. I'm not quitting anytime soon. We're following them all the way to Michigan, right? Because I don't think Canadian multinationals should run your, own your water. I don't think they should hold you hostage. <clears throat> you know, and at the same time, you know, like, look, I'm, I'm 62 years old. I spent my entire life in the fossil fuel era. Right? I went to drive-in movies. I mean, I've, I've had a blast. Sometimes I, sometimes I ordered flowers from Colombia, arriving the same day, you know. I drank Fiji water, if y'all drink that stuff. I always think you should get water that travels 8,000 miles. <laughs> Do you see the point? We ship a lot of stuff around. We need to ship all that stuff around, right? That's kind of the moment of when you start figuring out how to do things right. And that's this sitting bull plan. So some, sometimes it is called the, the uh, Green New Deal. Or maybe there's the, you know, the, the president's variety of it, which is the Build Back Better, right? I prefer to call it the sitting bull plan. And why I do that is because sitting bull, the character who you saw earlier, a great, a great leader of the Papa Lakota, he said many things in his, in his profound life, but he said, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. Let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. So, you know, in this epic moment that we are all in, prophesized, really, you know, by many peoples, where you have a choice between two paths, right? You know, and you are told that in your prophecies. When you have catastrophes of biblical proportions all around you. I say, let's do cool stuff and move on, you know? I'm all ready for the next economy, so this is what we do. This is where I live, my hemp farm. During the pandemic, I had a whole bunch of boys that moved in with me. Why? Because Granny has horses. And so pretty soon, I'm running pretty much a school for, I have like, there's like about 15 kids. They're all 15 from what I can figure, right? Except for there's one little dude who showed up this weekend bronking out ponies, who was 10. But anyway, we lived together because in the time of the pandemic, their school kept closed and they couldn't go anyway, right? And so we, I started to really look at what a relocalized economy looks like. And I think actually a lot of people did, you know, because you had to figure out how to survive, right? And so, this is us starting with our local food economy. You know, my interest is in reduced petroleum agriculture. I guess you would gather that from this lecture. The question is, is like, how can you produce without putting things that end inside all over your food, right? Pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, all that stuff that ends with side, that's the same thing as like homicide, suicide, and genocide, right? If it ends with side, it shouldn't go on food. That's like my simple theory, right? 
So trying to figure out how to do things in a different way and to figure out what the energy inputs are, right? And so our work is hand work, horse work, and some tractor work. You know, we are interested in sustainably, sustainable farming, you know, and we really are indigenous farmers is what we are. And so this is the girl team out in one of our fields. This is, in, and then this is uh, our horse-drawn farm equipment here. She's, this is Kara putting in a t the traditional corn varieties with a team of ponies, right? And then this is us ricing, right? Because in our case, not like everybody is so lucky as us, but we still have all our wild rice. That's me and my grandson out there on Shell Lake this year, right? And so a lot of our work is in how you protect the land so that you can keep eating there, right? Whether it's the maple sugar bush, it's about to start maple syruping time, you gotta keep a forest, right? They don't like grow in a plantation or something, you know? So all of these things is you keep your biodiversity and you take care of your local food systems. Now this is the potatoes. This is, I've, this last year, I only grew about seven kinds of potatoes, but the year before, I grew 17 kinds of potatoes. These are potatoes from the Potato Museum in uh, Peru, right? And this is the, these, you know, indigenous people, 900 kinds of potatoes, right? Now, the thing is, is that, you know, what the Irish potato famine should have taught us is that you want agrobiodiversity, not a monocrop, right? And so these potatoes and all these indigenous varieties, of which there are tens of thousands, in this case, there's 900 varieties of potatoes, but so many varieties of these, you know, heritage varieties of uh, these things, what, you, what we are interested in is in this time of uh, cataclysmic occasions and climate change, what's going to hang the best, right? That's the simplest way to put it, right? Which potatoes are good for what? So last summer when we had this massive drought, I grew all these potatoes and I was like, hey, those guys did good, right? Keep in mind, keep growing out the different, you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out how to feed a bunch of people, right? which I think is a really good idea for all of us. You know, because with all due respect, you know, not everybody's gonna get a Tyson chicken, you know, in my neck of the woods. In fact, we're more likely to get a wild turkey, you know? But my point is, is that these kinds of foods, they, they also teach you, you know, which ones are gonna be more resilient if you have the agrobiodiversity. Then, here's our cool old squash. Someone asked me earlier, a very funny conversation at dinner, what is your favorite squash? I like this because it's really taught me a lot. Corn taught me a great deal and squash taught me more. But this here squash, you know, I was given these seeds, I was told that they were like, they came, that they were, they came from an archeological dig and that there was this clay ball that was this big or something like that, that the seeds were in, they shook the clay ball and there were seeds in it. They, they carbon dated the seeds. They were supposed to be 800 years old and then they plant the seeds and they grew. Amazing. That's the story I was told. Then this white guy corrected me and he said, no, they actually come from a Miami seed collection and they're a thousand years old. I said, okay. You know, I mean, always good to be corrected by a white guy. But the, but the, the point was is that, is that, you know, there's a few lessons in that. One, clay ball. Did y'all hear that thing about the clay ball? Like, how are you gonna keep seeds for a thousand years? Got an idea? Like right now I got a bunch in my dorm fridge. You know, but you understand what I'm saying is, is like, what's the technology? Is the doomsday seed vault? Maybe, maybe not, right? Is that, what happened up in Norway? How's that going up there? And they, you know, they had like plumbing problems or something. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? The big seed vault, right? You know, but community seed saving is what you need. You keep the big vaults, but you make sure that the people have the seeds and they keep the seeds. That's the best way to have food security five centuries from now, right? And then figure out how to relocalize your food, quit throwing away food, quit being a bunch of chubby people. Is that enough to be said? I mean, look at this, we waste 40% of our food, you know, we travel 1,400 miles from farmer to table. In this portal, in this moment, if we wanna figure out how to hang for a long time, these are all things we're gonna to need to do. And then we are growing hemp. I'm interesting, is, do they have any hemp programs down here? Yes. So this is me, we are fiber hemp growers, right? And I'm interested in fiber hemp because uh, many reasons, but this, you know, this here won't get you high. 
This is uh, X59 variety, I, I believe, that we've grown here in this field. And it looks kind of like bamboo. And in that, it does all kinds of things. First of all, it, because it grows so rapidly, so fast, like grow eight, 10 feet in the course of a summer, right? It sucks down all this carbon, and when it sucks down that carbon, that's what you want to do in a climate, climate change. You want to suck down the carbon, right? So it does that more rapidly than about anything because it grows so fast, right? And it has this big, big stalks, and it's, and it's, and it's tough. So then, it, you know, it, it has, because of that, the fiber hemp, you know, I know that legalized cannabis is a huge economic industry, but I've been working mostly on this because the fiber hemp, then you can do all these cool things with it. Like, first of all, you could not have to do a bunch more cutting of your trees, and you could keep your forest intact, right? And you could do that, and, you know, I mean, so it grows so fast, you can get the same amount of fiber as you would from an acre of trees, but it only took you a year as opposed to 20 years, right? These are the kinds of questions that we need to address as we try to, as we transform, you know, into a more resilient economy. And our cotton, you know, does the same thing. Cotton uses all this kind of, of water and uses about a quarter of the world's agricultural chemicals, but it's only about 4% of the world's agriculture, right? And so it's, you know, as much as I like, so I've got the combination, but see, the best thing This is hemp. This is hemp. And what is so interesting about hemp, I see I was never a very big follower of hemp until six years ago, seven years ago. And you know, then I started think, learning about it, but you know, the word canvas comes from cannabis. Did y'all hear me say that? The word canvas comes from cannabis. So all of them sales, of all of them clippers, those were all hemp. All of that, all of that was hemp. You know, it, you can transform the materials economy entirely with hemp. So for the past um, seven years, this is my seventh year of growing. I have state of Minnesota permits and federal permits to grow hemp. I only grow fiber hemp. I mean, I don't only grow, but basically that's what I grow. And look at all these other cool things you can do about it, including I give some of my hemp to the Navajos and what do they do? They weave it. They put it in with their churro sheep wool and make a much more resilient because hemp is like much higher tinsel strength, right? And they take a rug that they were selling at Indian market and they were selling it for 6,000, they sold it for 12,000. And look at, then they gave me a little rug. And you see that stuff on top of it? That's what you do to replace fiberglass. I just insulated the south, a, a house, and I'm just about to insulate it, a tiny home with that stuff. It doesn't itch or not, anything, and it's got an R22 value. So why am I saying this? Because what if you could grow something that was a carbon sink that bioremediated, right? That could protect your forests, that could keep the agricultural, it doesn't require any, any chemicals. It requires good soil. You know, manure and fish fertilizer is what we've been using. And what if you could replace concrete? What if you could replace all of the wood in there? They're making hemp wood now. What if you could replace a lot of the things that are in this materials economy with something that protect, helped Mother Earth? That's what's so interesting. And then it's biodegradable in terms of plastics. So, we call this the new green revolution. That's what we call it. Because that's, you know, because I'm from Minnesota, and Minnesota has the University of Minnesota, which is where the green revolution came from. The father of the green revolution was Norman Borlaug at the University of Minnesota. And so we are going to have the new green revolution in northern Minnesota. And Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills. So I'm like, I just want those back, right? And then you do some solar. These are the, this is, you know, having spent all these years battling bad ideas, I am so much happier walking through the portal with the good ones, right? So we, we install and build these solar thermal panels in my village at Pine Point. This is, goes on the south facing wall, reduces your heating bill by 20%. And we make them 
right there in my village. You know, what if you could just start reducing your heating bills instead of trying to figure out how you're going to pay them? And you guys got to be pretty sunny too, you know, put up some wind. You know, Indian country has, you know, struggled over these issues of energy justice for the past hundred years. We have the uranium mines, the coal mines, the big dam projects, the gas and oil plants, the coal-fired power plants at Navajo. And we have all this wind potential. What if the next economy, the one that you get when you, you know, walk down the green path, was built with Indian people too? You know, what if we look at the, you know, <laughs> there's a reason that, you know, that they leave us alone on some of those reservations. Those are some windy places. You know, I mean, there's like class seven wind on about five of those reservations. You can barely stand up in the winter. It's windy as heck right now, you know? So this is the kind of potential you have. But, you know, you don't get to just put in new renewable energy without uh, fixing the problem. What am I trying to say here? This is a really cool, complicated graph. But basically, that rejected energy figure up there, you know what that means? That rejected energy means energy that you're wasted. So people say you can't re replace the present, you can't meet present demand with renewable energy. Have you heard people say that? You can't meet present demand of energy with renewable energy, right? And what you need to say to them, if they ever say that, is why would you want to meet present demand if you're wasting 60% of your energy? Like, who wants to walk around being dumb? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? You know, it's kind of like this here. Like, what's the most efficient way to get around the country? A train. You know, what's the most efficient car to drive? Is it a gas engine or an electric? It's an electric, right? But we've all been hanging out in, right? Fossil fuels, right? But we're, I mean, I've got the same thing. I got trucks, I farm, right? You all saw my farm? I'm waiting for my F-150 Lightning. That's what I want. Because why? Because there's an, a, a gas engine is 16% efficient and an electric engine is 65% efficient. So I just say, move along. Let's just leave that last economy, say thank you, and move into the more efficient next economy, which treats people good and has local food, grows hemp. You get around on some trains, right, that are electric, that are powered on wind turbines. This is called solutionary rail. It's this great idea coming out of the Northern Plains. Look at all those trains. You guys could get all over in them. And then look at us. I always just like this. You know, what does that say to you? It says that we're the most behind country of all, right? Look at that opportunity for improvement. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, what y'all kicking around and doing the next while? Let's fix some stuff. Let's make it better. This is a solar project. You know, this woman, her name is Melina Lupacon. She lives up in the middle of the tar sands. They don't even have electricity in that village. They have diesel generators. <laughs> There's a diesel generator at her health clinic up there in the middle of the tar sands where all the dirty oil comes from. And so for her master's thesis at the University of British Columbia about five years ago, she calls me up, she says, would you be on my master's committee? I said, oh yeah. So, so for her master's, she put up a solar project in the middle of her village to power her health clinic. She didn't do like a review of literature. You know what I'm saying? She didn't do like a feasibility study. She put the dang thing up. Cool, huh? You know, and a part of what I, my experience is in Indian country is like there's all this, like, you know, everything is crazy. There's all kind of bad stuff, you know, like my village has everything you don't want. At the same time, like, we do this stuff. We start fixing things, you know? And so my feeling is like, if we could do it, anybody could, right? Here's Navajo Solar. I think this is 29 kilowatts, 29 megawatts, excuse me. And then there's my village. 
make things better. This is a HUD housing project built in the 1960s. Welcome to my village. So we decided to start painting up our houses. So, you know, I was thinking, like, my long-term goal is to get, like, any of you guys ever go to California where they, is it in San Francisco, the Mission? I used to mean anything, there's, like, all this art, all these painted murals. I was like, maybe people come and see us. You know what I'm saying? We could sell Indian tacos, <laughs> lemonade, right? Come see our murals. I don't know, we're working on that. So the next economy, you know, the, the future is really tied to us working together. And uh, all these pictures I showed you about what we're, you know, what we're doing in our community. And, but uh, the bigger picture is, is like, we could do a lot of that here. This is a picture of D the Port of Duluth right near us. And you know what that is? That's wind turbine parts that are coming from Germany. And to me, as I look at this moment in time, you know, this portal between two worlds, this time when we are at this moment of a choice between two paths, I was like, just do the right thing. Start making stuff here. You know, a global economy is grand if you are into imperialism and such things. But at the time when, you know, you aren't even sure how you're gonna keep the lights on in your village, what if we just had a lot more solar? You know, what if we had a lot more local and what if we used a lot less? And, um, you know, in the end, in my last few thoughts, you know, um, I'm a water protector. I told you that at the beginning, I'm a water protector. And that woman on the, in the painting at the front, she's also a water protector. She came on a standing rock. But um, I, uh, you know, I believe in, in doing our best and also we pray hard. <laughs> and so this is a really interesting, these are some slides from Dr. Emoto in Japan. And he studied water crystals. And he studied water crystals and you can see them, but there's polluted water crystals, you can see what happens. You know, it hadn't really occurred to me that water from all those places was different. But it turns out it is. And it also turns out that if you pray, or, you know, I think that the, the water liked classical music, he said, that, that it re-stabilizes itself. You know, and I think that that's a really important thing to remember, is that life wants to be beautiful. And that, you know, this hard work and, and good intention changes things too, good prayers. And um, this, this man is Evo Morales, and he is the former uh, president of Bolivia, the first indigenous president of a Latin American country, of a South American country. And, um, you know, the, the country of Ecuador approved the rights of nature as a part of their constitution in 2008. And Bolivia affirmed the rights of nature as a part of their constitution in 2010. That's what indigenous thinking looks like when it's applied in legal systems. That's a lot different than the rights of corporations superseding the rights of people, which is what the American legal system says. The American legal system says that corporations are considered persons under the law. But I would say that that's impossible because a person has a soul <laughs> and a corporation doesn't have a soul. They're not a person. But in the transformation that is occurring between social movements and economic transitions, forced by technology, forced by climate change, forced by little people like me who divest you know, in stock. There is also this movement towards reaffirming the rights of nature. So the country of Bolivia, the country of Ecuador, in New Zealand, the rights of the, a river was recognized. The Waitangi River rights were recognized. In 2018 or 2019, my tribe recognized the rights of wild rice. 
because to us that is our most sacred food. And, you know, in December of this last year, the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court ruled that the rights of nature superseded the rights of a Canadian multinational and the Ecuadorian Mining Corporation to mine in a protected area. So I could talk to you about Indian people from long ago, or I could say in this moment in time, you know, together we are all transforming this world. And, um, you know, I'm grateful to be here with you in the deconstructing of the manifest destiny. And um, let's make a new, you know, good, that's my granddaughters. Make something new and good and beautiful together. Miigwech, thank you for your time. Thank you. Much. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate y'all coming out. I know you asked me a couple times, but I was kind of afraid to travel, and did you see how many children and horses I have? <laughs> I was like, I'll see you in a few days. I think there's enough hay. No, not quite. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I'm happy to take them. I think that there was, here, there's a powerful man here, yes. A microphone. So we need to thank you for the opportunity to ask questions of the person who wanted to come here. I can't hear you. Okay, I'm so sorry. I guess you guys can hear. Uh, so we are going to give you guys. Or can you just talk? I want to talk about this. Oh, I'm all official. I was trying to be really quiet, and I was oh, like. Oh, I, I was trying to be official, you know, like secret, secret service type. Anyway, uh, we are going to give Winona a chance to get some water real fast. Um, we have that for you over there. In the meantime, while she's doing that, we are going to uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions on, on Twitter. Um, Winona will be right back, and Jamie is going to uh, be the moderator for that q and um, I'm just here to uh, get you guys to ask some questions about what you guys just heard. Um, so yeah, I guess I will stay out here and wait. Uh, on Twitter, yes. So if you go to Twitter and you ask your question and then at UP Arkansas, you might also put in like hashtag Winona LaDuke, just so people don't think you're asking UP Arkansas a question. That might be good as well. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. Um, we're just gonna take a little recess here while we wait. Um, yeah. I guess I could, can, y'all wanna hear some stand up? No? Okay, yes. I was hoping y'all said no, cause I don't have any. <laughs> um, but just again, I wanna reiterate how, uh, how grateful we are that you guys were able to come out here and listen to Winona LaDuke. Um, it's been an honor to host her and uh, we are just so grateful that you guys were all able to make it. Um, so once again, thank you. Um, from university programs, and I know NASA as well is very happy to um, to be able to have put on this event. So, no, she's getting more water. Yes. If, um, yeah, if if you could, you can text Jamie. She could probably. Yeah. Jamie's here. She, she knows more than me, so. Yeah. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, hello, y'all. So, um, oh, I don't know if I'm which one I'm supposed to use. But, um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions for Wynonna or Duke, you can just uh, tweet them at University Programs. I'll have it pulled up on my phone. Um, or if you guys just want to ask them to me right now, and I can ask them to her. She 
She ran to the bathroom, I think, so. Just a short little intermission. Okay, yeah. No, you're good. I don't know. Does this one work? What, what, what kind of hemp fibers? Oh my God. <laughs> what, okay, so there's this really great film by Patagonia called uh, Misunderstood. You should all watch it. It's 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Like the best thing. And I, I really didn't know that much about this until like seven or eight years ago, right? I was like, oh, you guys are just all pot smokers. That's why you want us to have hemp. Literally, I was like so judgmental. Just be honest, you know? Now I feel like, oh my God, they were so right. You know, my point is, is, that, is that they said that in the 1920s, they, it, it was the best thing I've said was, there's a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. And we made the wrong choice. We went to hydrocarbon and carbohydrate was hemp. And the, you know, basically the word is, is that all these guys were like, the lumber barons were like, no. The cotton barons were like, no. Everybody was like, the oil companies were like, no. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do this because we see where the money is. And, the, and so they closed it down and there's this, uh, I gave a whole lecture on this like yesterday. But anyway, Anslinger was the head of the first head of the DEA or something like that, but he was like super racist too. And so they were like, the Mexicans are coming with the marijuana. There was the reefer madness. But you know, that's, you can't get high on my field of hemp. You know, it's a totally, it's the same plant, but you cannot get high on, the, on this stuff. You know, you get a headache, you try to smoke it. So it was just really a set of economic, you know, uh, it was it, it criminalized under the Marijuana Prohibition Act of 1938. But the, those, you know, everything was made out of hemp. Like a lot of equipment from the, you know, clothing from the war, and in, you know, hanging ropes required to be hemp. Initial farmers were required to grow a quarter acre of hemp and a quarter acre of flax. I mean, it was essential, an essential, central product. Super interesting to be, but it's, now it's like kind of like this cold case trying to figure out like where the equipment is. I mean, I have chased stuff all over this country and I've chased stuff all around, around Europe, you know? I mean, it's super interesting, but I think in the next couple of years, my, 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 my fiber, is in uh, North Carolina. That's near here, right? Someplace over here. Um, and they're running it through some processing. I would like to be able to do this. But in the way to doing this, I got super interested in the insulation, right? You understand what I'm saying? Because if you could get rid of fiberglass insulation in the building trades, if you could green the building trades, that'd be awesome, right? And so it's so interesting, but we're building an intertribal hemp cooperative, but it's farmers. It's not tribes, it's farmers. Because there's a lot of people like me that farm and we, we just want to make sure that they got a good market and they got all the technical support that they, that they want. Thank you for your question. It was like the longest answer ever. I'm sorry, but yeah. We got, oh, we got goats. And so I haven't really raised too much goats for cheese, but you know, we're looking at like an integrated pasture management program, right? Because I want to build soil, grow soil, right? And then also, you know, treat the different animals good. Uh, it's super interesting, um, you know, if in the textiles, because the goats have the angoras, you know, uh, 
Um, so you just treat things good. That's what, I don't, I'm, I don't really know how to answer. I mean, it's so, you know, it, around the world, people lived in pre cafo agriculture systems, right? I mean, the more, the bigger you get, the more industrialized you get, the more harmful it is to the environment and the more harmful it is to the spirit of the animal. There's no way around it. You know, and so anything that is this small reaffirming relationship, you know, uh, with soil, the smaller, you know, I'm a very big proponent of, you know, small scale agriculture. And then there's this section, the intersection between energy and agriculture is so important because the, you know, I mean, I live next to North Dakota and I can watch all their soil blowing over my reservation and I can see all their very expensive equipment and I can see the groundwater contamination. You know, it's all, you know, so much fossil fuels. But the smaller you get, the less of that you need. You know, and at the same time, you know, there's a lot of saying about how we're gonna feed everybody. Well, about 70% of the world's food comes from people like me. I mean, industrial agriculture provides a chunk and then, it, which is significant. And the challenge I think we have for, this is a big ag institution. This is not unlike University of Minnesota is figuring out how to do things, you know, in a respectful way and supporting the restoration of this sustainable agriculture. And I think that the hemp economy down here, because it also bioremediates. It's like such a phenomenally interesting plant to work with, you know. And so I'm really excited to see the transformation in agriculture. And I'm seeing it like right in front of my eyes. And we just bought, I mean, we just bought 700 acres of land. I don't even, you know, I just, and I'm like, we're gonna grow hemp there. I mean, so, and some of it's goats. I mean, we have like this rotated program. Yeah, y'all should send some people. We're very interesting with all our projects. Yeah. Other question? Yes. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, it's interesting. So, you know, those boys still live with me and they study Ojibwe and basically I'm trying to raise them to be farm managers. As you, I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like racing ponies is fun, but. <laughs> you know, but they do a lot, you know, in that and a lot of it's in our ceremonies. There are some language immersion schools and there are a number of really uh, stellar language programs, you know, in, in our communities. And um, so I feel like that there is, uh, you know, we're losing a lot, but we're gaining in this, you know, in the last 20, 20 years, we're gaining, we're starting to gain, you know, more that are interested in that. And um, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like that there's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's an ongoing challenge though. And particularly around things like, I think about um, like language related to, to cultural practice you know, like food, or, you know what I'm saying is like the descriptions of how you do things. It's so interesting, you know, learn, learning all of those. So thank you, thank you for your question. Yeah, was there, an, there was another question. Yes, back there. Thank you for your question. And um, actually there was a second part I was gonna say to him. So I'm, I'm hearing impaired. I mean, and it, it's getting worse, but it's okay. So I told my grandchildren and all those boys, I said, we're learning sign language now. <laughs> I was like, I could despair, or I could just say, let's just learn sign language so you can talk to me and we can all talk and, you know, super handy, because that's the indigenous, right? You know, we're the originators, so I said, we're gonna just, talk sign language now would be cool. But um, I think that, you know, 
So, you know, I admit that I am an addict, fossil fuel addict, right? You know, I think I clearly said that, you know, and I just want a way out, right? And so as we look at this country, like, I didn't really know anything about pipelines till about eight years ago, because, but we take them for granted. We just take energy infrastructure for granted. We just assume someone's got it, they're very smart, we're gonna pay a bill and it's gonna be okay. Well, it's not okay. We have like a D in infrastructure in this country. You've got pipelines breaking, you've got gas mains that blow up. You know, there was like Duke University did some study at Boston and I'm surprised that a whole city don't blow up. You know, good thing I don't smoke cigarettes because I wouldn't smoke there. You know, so my point is, is that we have all this infrastructure. Now one, you gotta clean it up. You gotta replace stuff that doesn't work instead of let it keep leaking, right? That's like point one. But you get in this battle like we did with Enbridge, they're like, oh, we can't replace it in place. I was like, yes, you can. Complete lies, complete fabrication. You know, like you just, you know, I mean, you know, they do it in the city, buddy. You know, so it's just like this whole, like, being held hostage by energy infrastructure companies, you know, is exactly what it is. And, and it's particularly appalling to me that these are, Cana it's a Canadian corporation. And I, everybody's like, that's cool. I was like, no, it's not cool. It wasn't cool if it was an American corporation, but it's certainly not cool. Like, if it, if it was a Saudi corporation, or if it was a Chinese corporation, you know, would we all be saying, that's cool. No, we probably wouldn't. It's because it's Canadian, <laughs> you know? But it's still a foreign corporation that controls all your infrastructure. That's, like, dumb, right? So, one, you got to get a handle on the mess. Two, you got to start doing things like uh, making the companies pay for fixing it. Because what happens in this country is that it becomes a super fun site and then you and I pay for it. And that's fundamentally wrong. They made the profit off of it. It wasn't a service. They just condemned our land and arrested us for private interest. I mean, I don't have a spigot onto that pipeline. Line three, it's not a public pipeline, it's a private pipeline of a Canadian corporation and the oil goes back to Canada where it gets refined in Sarnia. I mean, give me a break. Okay, sorry. I have some PTSD, <laughs> right? But you, you understand what I'm saying? So all of that is ripe for policy challenges. Like the governor of Michigan ordered them to close down the pipe under the Straits of Mackinac, Ma May 13th, last year. Did they do that? No. So if a governor orders you to close down and a federal court orders you to close down in the case of the Dakota Access Pipeline and you don't close down, how's that work? Your pipeline company, so you don't have to close down? I mean, the thing is, is that they're like, oh, we need that oil because we're all addicts. Well, you didn't actually need that oil. You know, a lot of that isn't even going, you know what I'm saying is it's going to another port. It's not like you and I are consuming all of this oil. So get efficient, make those guys clean it up, you know, get real energy plans so that you don't do additional pipeline construction. Get a decommissioning plan. I mean, Enbridge needs a decommissioning plan. They've got, you know, if something goes, if the Straits of Mackinac has an accident, that's like a $6 billion. You understand what I'm saying, how this works? These accidents, they can't pay for it because they're Canadian multinationals. And the money's in, you know, you understand what I'm saying is this gets adding up, so I get things cleaned up, you know? That's what I think. And it's, and it's, you know, talk about, I was thinking about the big jobs programs that we could have out of that. You know what I'm saying? They always want to build something new, like now they want to build the carbon pipeline, which is kind of like the nuclear waste ferry, you know? <laughs> I'm going to take the carbon, we're going to put it over there, and it's going to be okay. No, it won't be okay. You just quit making it. You know, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's like, just don't let them do new dumb ideas. Just clean it the last round. You know, my infrastructure ad advice, don't do dumb stuff. <laughs> anyway, somebody else had a question in here. Um, yeah. We have some on Twitter too, so. Yeah. Just, if you wanna get to Yes. Well, 
Oh, we're working on it. You know, we have some of it. I have a hemp creek greenhouse we built last year, right? And I have a bunch of the hemp processing right there. And then we have a bunch of the weaving pieces and we do have the insulation on site. And I don't have any hemp wood, but I'm thinking about, I, I, we have another farm where the goats are. That's where I think I'm gonna put the hemp wood. I think I'm putting the hemp wood floor in the kitchen. Yeah, so that's exactly what I am trying to do is to show, is to show it's, you can live with hemp, you know, and that it's a really good, and, and so we're working on just starting that, you know. Uh, and then my next question is about the squash. You know, the squat, those squash seeds you can get from Baker Seed Company now. Yeah, that's like, it was so funny, I saw, and it's even called, see, I named the squash. It's a funny story, but you know, people would like, I, I was given the seeds and then I give these lectures and people would say, well, what's it called? What's it called? And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, but then I was like, well, white guys name stuff. <laughs> so, so then I named it, it's called Gete Okosamen, which means really cool old squash. <laughs> and then I looked there in the Baker Seed catalog and it's called Gete Okosamen. I was like, that's how you know you arrived. You know? <laughs> but you can get, like, if you look at, like, Seed Savers or, or, like, those guys, like Baker Seed, there's a lot of them, these really great seed companies now. And we just need to support them. And, like, during the pandemic, they said that, like, seed sales quadrupled. So I was like, keep it up, guys. Just keep, you know what I'm saying? We're doing it. Just keep doing it. Yeah. You know, a lot of the tribes in our region are working to restore the bison. I, I don't have really a bison range. Um, I, you know, I have worked on a puff, couple of buffalo ranches and we do have like three on our reservation. They're smaller scale. Um, and uh, I work with buffalo farmers around us, but I don't, my tribal, I don't have one myself. No, but I think there's like, I'm thinking there's like 50 tribes that have bison programs now, right? Yeah, f about 50, yeah, the Intertribal Bison uh, Cooperative. Yeah, yeah. That's really funny, this is Maori. Um, okay, so when I turned 50, I was having, I was like, I was like, this is, I had a very tough year the year before, like my house burned and, you know, it was like all this really exciting stuff. I was like, oh. so then I was like, um, Looks like I'm supposed to be around a while. Looks like they got some big work for me ahead. So I like went, I went to New Zealand for this conference and one of my Maori girlfriends, she was like, come on, we go get some moku. And she goes, so this here is what, so this is a, it's a hammerhead shark. That's what that is. They said, we give you our toughest guy. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's all this other stuff in there, but it was, um, yeah, it's uh, Maori. And so it was done over there, yeah. So it's like, uh, every time I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I'll keep, get, keep at it. Yeah, in the back. So, um, back in September, I went to the Peace Camp to spend some time with the Maori people. Oh, thank you. And uh, I really wanted to do that and read it, but I also didn't know if you had engaged Christianity in any part of that. You know, that's, I think it's such, you know, so powerful, like, and I've been watching it and participating in it. You know, I'm the guardian of the shell where I got arrested. I was, you know, the tribe appointed me the guardian at Lightham. You know, so I was doing my duty when I got arrested, right? But um, there is a movement internationally. And, it, and a lot of um, the, the Yurok tribe um, reaffirmed the rights of the, of the uh, Klamath River. 
right? Which is also where there's this bat, there's these dams, the Iron Gate Dam, and the Nez Perce tribe affirmed the rights of the Snake River. And then the, uh, is it the Skagit tribe by Seattle? They affirmed the rights of the salmon. And uh, so I see this movement, and, and there's this whole, like, you know, on, on, you know, the fact is that legal systems are functions, you know, the creator didn't say corporations shall be persons under the law. I got that one. You know what I'm saying is, is that legal systems are creations of societies. You know, you're trying to do justice. And this one has gone, what foundationally was flawed. Foundationally. And, you know, obviously slavery was legal in this country, right? You know, just one thing after another after another. And uh, so it, just seeing the evolution is so interesting to me. And I just think that the more that we began to have these discussions, um, I saw a, another recent discussion about the, the uh, you know, the rights of the water. Um, and, um, I, you know, I'm just seeing it change. And when that Ecuadorian court decision came down in December, I was like, you know, because it's right. Oh, you know, and, and I think also I, I saw that, I, I don't know if it was Papua New Guinea, I think it was Papua New Guinea declared uh, ecocide a crime. You know, that's the evolution, you know, of, of the legal systems. You know, I was having a discussion uh, a few days ago about, about this topic. And, and what I know, which I think we all fundamentally know, is that the violence of the technology has exceeded anyone's pretense at regulation. What do I mean? You crossed that long ago, but a perfect example would be nuclear testing. That's why I first heard someone say this. Was, was, was you know, a woman from the Philippines, you know, Marshall Island people talking about nuclear testing. Like, who regulates that? Who regulates the long-term intergenerational impact on people when you do something that violent as nuclear testing, right? Like, so there's the, reg the, the regulatory authorities that exist have been exceeded by the violence of the technology because nobody even knows what happens, right? Or this summer, I watched it. I watched all of those Tesla, did you see them all, those Tesla satellites? Right? Yeah, I mean, there was this line of tests. It was eerie. It was, you know, because I live way out there where the wild things are. And we were like, are those like following each other? It was like a line of his, his satellites, right? You know, who's in charge of like all of those waves? And do you know what I'm saying? Like, who's regulating this? Nobody. Nobody. And that's why this, this fundamental, the rights of Mother Earth should supersede the rights of corporations, because someone has to say no, because there's no regulation that stops them. Of Michigan? Yeah. You know, and so from my perspective, like, we are, you know, we are calling to question, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm an Anishinaabe woman, and I'm also someone who spent seven years trying every remedy in the state of Minnesota to stop a crime from happening. It's a crime what they did to us. Crime. And then I got arrested while they were committing the crime. And my position is, is that I'm not the criminal, you know. And so we have this campaign in Minnesota called Drop the Charges. 81,000 letters so far. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, drop the charges. Yeah, write to Governor Walt, say drop the charges against the water protectors. I mean, they've dropped a lot of the charges. They're like trying, you know, but, but they wouldn't do that if we didn't, if we didn't say something, you know? Do I have what?
Well, they have the whole pipeline in. And, you know, now they are trying to get across Wisconsin on line five. And I kind of showed you some maps. We call this Enbridge 5.0. And they're trying to move, and they have even more resistance and more legal problems there. You know, that's what I'm saying is get them to clean up the mess before they go bankrupt. You understand what I'm saying? Because, like, we're the kind of people that make them go bankrupt. They aren't doing well, you know? And in the meantime, you know, we never had our appeal heard in federal court. That we asked for an environmental impact statement. There's no federal environmental impact statement on this project. None. It's messed up. You know, you can't put in 915,000 barrels of oil across the, you know, Great Lakes without an EIS. No federal EIS. There's a state EIS. State system suffered from, you know, immense, it's called regulatory capture, when a corporation controls your government, you know, or your, or your you know, across the board, across the board. But we, um, you know, we uh, uh, are dogging them in the, in the regulatory system. You know, first of all, we are, we're pushing the state to prosecute, right? Um, but our tribe itself sued them. Wild Rice sued them in, in um, tribal court on August 4th. It, it's, if they appealed to the federal courts, and the federal courts said no, said send them back to tribal court, and then they appealed a second time to the federal court, and we don't have a, a decision yet. And in the meantime, you know, our tribe is continuing. I was, a, but a number of the cases of tribal members, including myself, were transferred to tribal court. But two counties want to want, want to keep me, so I'm like, let's have fun. <laughs> sure, we always need donations to the legal fund or to honor, honor the earth, you know, honor the earth. And then we, you know, I mean, but, but uh, also just, you know, our story has to be told. I mean, everybody should give us money, but the fact is, is that Canadian corporations shouldn't get to own your police, one. You know what I'm saying? It's like, there's like, two, I mean, if I had done this in Wisconsin, those would have been all felony charges. I have misdemeanor charges. The criminalization of people like me, First Amendment rights, I mean, I didn't, I didn't break anything, I didn't touch anything, I stood there, you know? But there's, uh, you know, just the whole criminalization of water protectors. And, and to me, it's like really this end of the, it's like last stages of addiction behavior. It's like fossil fuel addiction. You know, where everybody's like, oh, you gotta put those water protectors in jail, we did get our, we gotta get our oil pipeline. I was like, no, you don't. Why did you do that to us? Why did you pit family against family, brother against sister, Indian against white person? Why did you just do that to us? So a Canadian multinational could make some bucks? That's what they did, you know? They brought the worst hatred out in the era of Trump, you know? I mean, it's, it's you know, it, and, and it's wrong. At the same time, you know, now we get to see everything, right? But I'm like, what we really want is a way out. So that's why I'm growing hemp. Did I already tell you all that? <laughs> all right, and I'm, and I'm solar, and then I went, like, last week I went to UMass Amherst, and these guys are making super capacitors with hemp, with my hemp, which doubles the lifetime of a battery. Because it turns out that there's something in, when the carbon grows, it grows so fast, and it takes down all that carbon from the air, when that gets into the fiber of those big, tall plants that I was telling you, there's something about the chemical composition in there that when you, bur when you burn it and turn it into biochar, it's a very great, significant, I don't know, it's a very high quality graphene that you use for electronics. Who would have thunk, huh? <laughs> That's what I said. I was like, really? But you know what? That's what I mean. It's like, I think that there's this good potential, like, you know, and, and you know, just, you know, just kind of in closing, I want to say, look, I feel like that, um, you know, we are in this moment, you know, it's this really epic moment in the history of the world, right? I mean, you could all, we could all pretend, but that'd be kind of like ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, you got social forces all around changing the world, you got the Black Lives Movement, 
You know, more people voted in this last election than in history, right? And half of us didn't even want to vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> I was making egg rolls and driving people to the polls. But my point is, is that people can make a difference, right? Vote again. <laughs> vote again, yeah. And right, but, it ta but do more than vote. You know, be the little, the little, little guys that change the food system. You know, you guys got a lot of that here. Yeah, run for office. That's right. Right. Yeah, the fast fashion. Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm largely a thrift score child myself. Yeah, quit buying stuff, right? I mean, what did, I was, there was some study that came out and said that there's, we have more stuff than all the biosphere. Like, there's more stuff, we have more stuff as humans than all the elephants and the whales and the trees. And we're still not happy. I was like, we gotta move on. You, you had a question. Okay, so her, the question was, uh, what specific steps would I advocate for food and energy? For somebody who wanted to? You know, so I, so you know, the, the thing is, is like, I grow all this food, but we went around and figured out, like in our community where people shopped. Do you know what I'm saying? Is like, we figured out the value of our food economy. Does that make sense to y'all? Like, because people are all going off to town, right? And like, what if you could circulate there with local farmers or you could figure that out, right? So figuring out what your food economy is like and then making the food economy available. I'm a, I'm a big, you know, a lot of our tribes, there's a lot of emphasis on making full-time employment or jobs, but then that money just goes off reservation. It doesn't even come back. And you don't necessarily need the money. What you need is the food and the energy, you know. And, and so I think a lot of the strategy is first, don't waste, right? But second, like, get it local. Figure out how to make it yourself. You know, you guys got a lot of solar potential, you know. And you got a lot of, like, things like light manufacturing potential, you know. All the kind of stuff. And... Uh, so I think that you do kind of an assessment of how to rebuild a local economy. And um, my tribe is probably, you know, a lot of our tribes are the same. Like my tribe doesn't have, you know, my tribe does, what my tribe does have is we have maple syruping, right? We're about to start syruping, right? And then we have farming and we can fish and we can get our wild rice. You know what I'm saying? Is we still have a very strong subsistence economy that feeds a lot of people in my community, right? But my tribe doesn't have any manufacturing, right? Except for us, we make the solar thermal panels, right? But I'm like, you need to build an integrated economy for your tribe, and, and so that's, that's just kind of, there's no, there's no easy answer, but there's a lot of people, and you know, you're welcome to you know, take a look at our stuff or correspond with us. We have some, I think we even have some booklets on tribal economies, you know? But there's a lot of easy, uh, good ways to do things, but a lot of it, I think, just involves, I wanna say common sense. You know, because I feel like that there's a lot of, uh, it, you know, rebuilding a local economy is really like what's the, the right thing to do. And a lot of it involves what was there. You know what I'm saying? Because, you, you know, whether it's the river or the soil, you know, it's what, what was there. Because your economy has to be based on the land. You know, your fabulous idea is great, but work with what you got, right? And so that economy is the economy that was there a lot of times. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for your question, though. Yeah. Is there any other questions here? 
Ja. What advice would I give to the next generation of climate activists? Um, on, you know, uh, the party's over. The party is over. The climate activists that are dealing with the fossil fuel, telling people to move from fossil fuels, just telling the fossil fuel party is over. It's so over. You know, and how you know it's over is that uh, Exxon isn't at the top of the S&P anymore. Who's at the top of the S&P? Like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, right? Those other guys, the, be the billionaires are the disruptive technology guys from the tech world. And the guys who want to build, who are building electric cars. I mean, Musk's, you know, that wasn't supposed to work. You know, everybody bet against that guy. But so when everybody divests from the tar sands, you know, even the Saudi sovereign fund divested from the tar sands and Harvard University divested from the tar sands. I was like, the party's over. The Koch brothers divested from the tar sands, it's over. What you need to do is to move into the next economy, which is the, you know, this, this local food, local energy. And the big, the big challenge now is really going to be the batteries and the storage. And, you know, I feel, feel like we're on the edge. And in Minnesota, that's like a front line of that battle because they want to open a mine for nickel. And we're going to maintain that they need either the sodium or, you know, that there's other technologies to use. They're trying to, like, open last generation's mine for the last generation technology. You know what I'm saying? But what we need to do is to move to, you know, the next generation. And in addition to that, I mean, which I'm in super interested in hemp. But in addition to that, we just need to not waste so much and not transport so much. And, you know, that... Those, those issues are going to help transform our economy. And when you transport, transport in a cool way, like drink, you know. Thanks for your question. You guys, like, have a lot of questions. I mean, it's okay. It's great. You know, I haven't been someplace where people ask all these, like, interesting and varied. You know, these have been Farm really school. great questions. And I appreciate everyone willing to step up and ask. It's been awesome. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for coming. You are such an inspiration to me, and I know everyone else in this room. Um, the Native American Student Association thanks you for being here. It's such an honor. And you, your wisdom, I hope that everybody can take with them. So can everyone please give her another round of applause?